Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, sort of a bunch of stuff we've done related to learning language through interaction. So I guess the, the sort of like high level view that I want to get across is um, you know, NLP and sort of AI more generally has had a lot of success over the past 20 years um, by doing machine learning and in particular by doing uh, like supervised machine learning. And this works really well when you can get bunch of, bunches of labeled data, um, which you can do for narrow tasks and narrow domains in like one language or two languages or five languages. Um, but I guess what I'd like to sort of argue is that um, if we want sort of like broad coverage language systems across a large number of tasks and a large number of domains and a large number of languages, I don't think it's really feasible to get all of the label data that we could possibly need to, to train things like independently. And so um, the, the sort of direction that we've been pushing is uh, maybe I can get a little bit of stuff somehow and build some initial system for solving a task and then deploy this in, a, in like a real world setting where it's interacting with people and then use the interactions with people to try to drive the, the performance higher um, and, and learn from these interactions. Um, OK, so, so that's sort of the view. Um, I'm going to, right, so I guess uh, pretty much probably most people here know what NLP is. So I'm not going to bore you telling you what NLP is. I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about sort of these like more or less like complicated uh, language problems, so in particular, I'll focus on um, machine translation and question answering for, for pretty much the majority of the talk. Um, so I guess I should also say, like, I do believe in learning through interactions, so if you have questions, you should ask me questions. Um, and uh, there's plenty of stuff that I can squeeze uh, throughout the talk um, in case time is running low, right? Um, oh, and also just to verify, like, uh, we're, like, out of this room at 11, is that right? Yeah, OK. Um, all right, so uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, some machine translation stuff. So in particular, I'm going to talk about this simultaneous interpretation project that we've been working on for maybe three or four years now. So this is um, mostly with Jordan Boyd Graber at um, University of Colorado. So who's actually seen a, si a human simultaneous interpreter do their job? OK. Actually, a bunch of people. I, I'm really impressed with people in Seattle. Like when I ask that question, other places, like everyone's like, no. Um, but like, so human simultaneous interpreters are amazing, right? They they like hear language, in, like, they hear speech in one language, and they produce speech like more or less with as little delay as possible in another language. And uh, it's it's sort of this like weird, almost subconscious process where if you quiz them afterwards on like what did you talk about, they only have like a vague recollection of like what the topic was. It, it's really an amazing fact that people can do this. Um, so anyway, so simultaneous interpretation started basically then at the end of World War II with the Nuremberg trials, and this basically happened because the the previous model for interpretation was consecutive interpretation, and where you know someone says a sentence. They finish the sentence, then it's translated to the other languages, and then they say another sentence and so on. And they basically figured that if they do this, the trials are going to take forever. Um, and so uh, they needed to sort of invent this idea of doing uh, simultaneous interpretation in order to like reduce the delay and sort of make the conversation more natural. So I want to give an example from like a Skype Translate video. So um, Skype Translate is like awesome, but I'm going to pick on them. Um, so uh, I'll show the video and then I'll, I'll have some like commentary at the end. Maybe I'll show the video. Good afternoon, Melody. How are you? Okay, so um, so why am I showing this video? So I actually want to say a couple things about this video. So the first is like, okay, this is amazing that we can do this. Like the the Skype Translate people deserve like huge props for like the amount of hard work that went into this. And obviously there are videos you can find on YouTube that don't make errors. I of course picked one that makes errors. Um, 
So, but, but it's also like super awkward to do this like consecutive translation, right? If it were like a high stakes environment, like I'm in a courtroom or I'm meeting with a doctor in a foreign country or something like that, I might be able to tolerate this, this awkwardness with the delay. Um, but if I'm just trying to talk to like, uh, like my father-in-law or something, I'm gonna give up after a couple turns because it's just super annoying to like uh, have to wait, even if there aren't errors. Um, so that's one thing. So then the second thing is like the, this, this sorry Melanie say that again business, right? So um, when the system hears that, like it should know it did something wrong, right? It, it doesn't know what it should have done, right? No one's telling it what the right answer was, but at least it, it's getting a signal that like what it did the last time was, was erroneous in some way. And then after that, Melanie repeats herself. In this case, she repeats herself verbatim. Um, you could imagine that she might also paraphrase herself or, or say something slightly different. Um, and then the system translates that correctly. There's no you know, second, sorry, Melanie, say that again. And so this again gives like some supervision that uh, whatever the system did incorrectly the first time should maybe have been replaced with what it did the second time or something similar to what it did the second time. Um, so I want to distinguish at this point between two types of feedback that we could have. So I want to talk about implicit feedback and explicit feedback. Um, so I'm going to think of things like, sorry, Melanie, say that again, as implicit feedback. Now you could say like, well, this is pretty explicit. Like it's basically saying you screwed up. Um, but what I want to say is explicit feedback is like an actual numeric signal that I can try to optimize. So. Um, you could imagine a system where like, you know, you have a one star to five star button as you're going along. And uh, if someone hits the four star button, that's going to be explicit feedback as far as I'm concerned. Implicit feedback is going to be anything that's sort of said that the, um, that the system's going to try to convert to an explicit signal that it can try to optimize. Okay, so for most of the talk, I'm actually going to talk about explicit feedback where you get some like, uh, sort of direct loss signal that you're trying to optimize. Um, and then at the end, I'll come back to the, the implicit question. All right, all good? Okay, so uh, let's dive in a little bit. So why is simultaneous interpretation hard? Well, it's hard because languages are different, um, and they're not just different in that they use different words, they put them in different orders. Um, so uh, here I have an example of basically glossed Japanese to English. So if you wanna say, the dinosaur went to the store, you say dinosaur store go. Uh, so the verb goes at the end. Um, so this verb object versus object verb distinction correlates with a bunch of other word order distinctions. So for instance, uh, languages that put verbs at the end tend to put relative clauses before the nouns they modify, um, and the verb goes at the end of the relative clause. So for instance, if you want to say the dinosaur who wanted to buy food went to the store, you would say food buy dinosaur store go. Um, so the issue here is that uh, if you're translating from say, Japanese to English, uh, after you've said the dinosaur, you now need to wait until the Japanese speaker says the verb, which in the case uh, of a very long object phrase uh, could be a long time from now, right? So if it's something like the dinosaur went to the very friendly store on the corner of 8th Avenue and 22nd Street, then you have to wait through this entire object before you get the verb went, right? And so, so this is gonna make things slow. Um, so in case you don't think that this is actually a problem, so uh, here are like 1,200 languages in the world. Uh, English is here. These are Native American languages, not, ver not like dialects of English. Someone, someone asked me if Southern English is uh, object verb. Um, it is not, as far as I know. Um, so yeah, so English is a red dot, it's verb object, Japanese is a blue dot, it's object verb. It's basically 50-50, so if you pick any two languages at random, uniformly at random, uh, there's a 50% chance you're gonna have to deal with this problem. Okay, so, I mean, also not to imply that two languages that are both red dots have the same word order, right? Like, uh, this, this dot and this dot probably have quite different word orders, but just not in the object verb uh, setting. Okay, so uh, I have, like one slide on how does normal machine translation work. And I'm gonna do this because I'm gonna use this as a black box. Um, and so I just wanna like say quickly what goes on, right? So if I wanna do normal uh, non-simultaneous translation, what I typically do is I get a bunch of text. So the most classic example is the Canadian Hansard, which is published in French and English. I break it into aligned sentence pairs. 
I learn some sort of statistical model to map between the source language and the target language. And then when I get a new sentence, say in French, that I want to translate, I apply the statistical model. So um, for the first, the sort of early experiments that I'll show in this talk, this statistical model is going to be a phrase-based machine translation system. In the later experiments that I'll talk about in the talk, the uh, statistical model will be a neural machine translation system. But it really doesn't matter. Um, all that matters is I have some like off-the-shelf uh, MT system. And I'm basically going to try to develop a model that can take this non-simultaneous thing and turn it into a simultaneous thing. OK, so um, one of the things that we did when we first started this was we wanted to understand how does interpreted speech differ from normal translations. Um, so here's the experiment. So we got a bunch of TED Talks in Japanese. We had uh, an interpreter interpret them into English. So in this case, the interpreter said the phrase number one only is accepted, and phrases two, three, four were not accepted. Uh, and then after the fact, we took transcripts of the TED Talk, and we gave it to human translators and asked the translators to just translate this. And they're free to do whatever reordering they want. And so in this case, the batch translator said something like, they might recognize expression one, but not expression two to four. So this is obviously much more fluent, right? Like, I'm sure everyone in this room prefers that translation to that translation. Um, but the thing that's uh, sort of important that's going on is that the verb recognize on the Japanese side comes much later. And so the interpreter is sort of forced to say all this other stuff before they say, um, I mean, they say accepted rather than recognize. But it's basically the same in this context. OK, so uh, we did sort of like a corpus analysis of what goes on here. Um, and these are the most common things that you see. So um, you see a bunch of. Uh, so the interpreters do a bunch of things related to trying to move words around. So uh, the two most common are either segmentation into multiple sentences, so a single Japanese sentence to like two or three English sentences, um, and then lots of passivization, which is probably the first thing you would think of. Like if you are speaking English and you want to move the verb somewhere else, like you're going to passivize the sentence. Um, they also do a bunch of word generalization. So like if I'm translating into uh, French, which I don't speak very well, um, and someone says, like, sea bass, I might be like, oh, I don't remember how to say sea bass. Um, and so uh, because the interpreters are under this, like, really strong time pressure, they'll often just say fish um, and hope that in the context it doesn't matter. Um, and then, of course, they also just drop lots of stuff. So um, one of the things that surprised me talking to interpreters is I always thought that the reason that interpreters try to keep pace with the speaker is to make the conversation more natural. But all of the interpreters we talk to, um, they actually say that they try to delay as much as possible. But at some point, their short-term memory starts failing. And if they don't get the words out, they'll just forget them and drop them entirely. So humans are operating under this like these two strong um, like retrieval constraints and short-term memory constraints that obviously systems don't have, right? Like your system's not going to be like, oh, you said that five words ago. I forgot. Um, and so I think for this reason, this is one of these problems where we can actually do better than people. Um, I mean, we can't do better than people today and probably not tomorrow. But I think that uh, you know, machines don't have a lot of the constraints that people do. And so I, I think this is something where we can do really, really well. OK, so here are a couple more examples. So. Uh, here's a Japanese sentence. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, you see some word generalization. So the batch translation produces honorific, which is basically correct, um, whereas the interpreter says polite, uh, which is some sort of a hypernym. Uh, the interpreter segments this into two sentences, and they replace adequately with enough. Um, so there's one example. So here's another example. So here. The batch translator says its third characteristic is that its output is as much as possible in the natural language of spoken Japanese. The interpreter says, and the third feature, so that's a word generalization, is that the translation could be produced in a very, so that's sort of a summarization of as much as possible, natural spoken language. And then the interpreter doesn't even say Japanese at all. Um, and Japanese does appear on the Japanese side, so it's not like the batch translator is just making that up. Um, OK, so th these are a couple of examples of what happens. And so what we're going to try to do is basically build a model that can um, I 
use some of the same tricks that human interpreters have to try to get ahead of, um, of the speaker so that they can keep pace. Um, so this is now one of those sort of awkwardness of, uh, so, so in case you haven't noticed, I have like references in case you want to look at papers. So this is now kind of strange because this corpus analysis is 2016 and then our model that tries to replicate this is 2014 and that's because uh, ACL doesn't always like to accept analysis papers and so this paper took quite a while to get in. Um, and the model, you know, if you're like, ooh, model, um, I'm gonna accept that. So, uh, so this actually appeared earlier, although it, it really came later in terms of uh, when we did the work. Um, okay, so we're gonna try to model what like a, a human interpreter would do. And so uh, they're gonna be listening to the input stream. Uh, and at each point in time, which basically means after every word, they have a bunch of options, so they can choose to wait. So this means just hear another word. Um, they can try to guess what the next verb is going to be. Uh oh. Okay. So they can try to guess what the next verb is going to be. So this is something that human interpreters do a lot. So if I get a sentence in Japanese like yesterday, I Tokyo to flew. If we're talking about like travel already, and I say yesterday I Tokyo you as an interpreter might guess that I'm gonna be talking about traveling to Tokyo. And so you're just gonna say like, yesterday I went to Tokyo, and then you're gonna hear the speaker say flew, and you're gonna be like, by plane, right? So this is an example of like, I'm gonna pick sort of a vague verb, and then I'm gonna to try to correct it later. Um, so one of our interpreters, he, has like, he does a lot of business interpretation, and his favorite verb is promote. So pretty much anything can be promoted. And like when you finally hear what the verb is, you can almost always like massage promote into like whatever it is that you need it to be. Um, not in a biomedical context, their promote actually means something. Um, but in a business context, promote is like an awesome verb to use. Um, okay, so we can try to predict the next verb. We can just try to predict the next word to get like one word ahead. Um, we can commit, so this basically means speak. Okay, so now sort of full disclosure, so we're not actually doing speech, I don't know anything about speech. Um, so we're working off of transcripts, um, and the transcripts are human transcripts, so there's not like uh, ASR noise. Um, so obviously things get harder once you add um, the noise that you get from speech recognition. Okay, so we have a changing environment, so the environment is basically the words we've seen so far, and our model's internal predictions about what the next verb is gonna be, stuff like that. Um, and we have data from human interpreters uh, where we can essentially reverse engineer what did the human interpreter do. So the, this data is like time stamped and so we can look at like when did the interpreter wait and when did the interpreter predict and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is a pain but you can do it. Um, and so we can basically transform our interpretation data into uh, like an expert sequence of actions of what you should do at each point in time. Okay, so now we need to train a model to predict actions given state. Um, so I'm gonna eventually like complicate this, but I'm gonna start with uh, kind of the simplest, oh, sorry, I'm not gonna do the algorithm, I'm gonna do an example. <laughs> All right, so here's a, here's a German example. So I don't speak German, I apologize for butchering this, but it's something like, ich bin mit dem Zug nach Ulm gefahren, which means I am with the train to Ulm traveled. Uh, and if you were to interpret this, you'd have to say like, I traveled by train to Ulm, right? So, um, so the system at some point will have heard, for instance, mit dem Zug. It's gonna guess that the final verb is gewesen, which I think means have, German speakers. What is it, it's have? Yes. Um, and it thinks the next word is gonna be und. Uh, this is wrong, so we hope that it waits. Uh, so now it hears a little bit more and it thinks the final verb is gonna be that word, which I'm not gonna say. Uh, and uh, the next word is gonna be nur. This again is wrong, so you hope it waits. So now it hears a bunch more. Um, so now it's basically heard, I am with the train. It thinks that the, the verb is gonna be gefahren, which is correct. Um, it thinks the next word is all, or sorry, is Berlin, which is like a reasonable guess, but it's wrong. Um, so in this case, what we want it to do is we want it to predict the final verb. So it's basically gonna tack this final verb onto the end of what it's actually heard, and then run this through whatever our off-the-shelf machine translation system is. This is gonna produce some output, like I traveled by train. Um, and so we're now gonna say, I traveled by train. Um, so now at this point, we still think the next word is gonna be Berlin, which is wrong, so we wanna wait. 
Um, so now we hear uh, to ohm, so now we produce to ohm. Uh, and then at the end, we decide that we've, we're done and we've translated everything. All right, so this sequence of actions is the type of action sequence that we're trying to learn to, to mimic. OK, so uh, how are we going to do this? So initially, we're going to use this algorithm called Dagger, which is like my favorite algorithm. Um, if you ever heard me give a talk, I've probably talked about Dagger, and I've probably used this slide because I love this slide. So um, I'm going to switch from talking about interpretation to driving a car because it's an easier thing to draw sort of pictorially. Um, so what am I going to do? So I'm going to get an expert driver. I'm going to put them in the car. The expert driver I'm going to call pi star. The uh, expert is going to drive the car. And I'm going to collect a bunch of state action pairs from uh, the expert's trajectory. So for every state visited by the expert, I'm going to generate a labeled example where the input is the state and the output is the action taken by the expert at that state. Um, so this is basically a labeled data set of state action pairs. And I can take whatever my favorite off-the-shelf classifier is and train a classifier, which I'll call pi1, on this data set. Um, so the problem with pi1 is that it's only been trained on states that the expert visited. So if it ever gets off path, uh, it's going to kind of throw up its hands and be like, I have no idea what to do. Or in the worst case, that's going to happen. So what do I want to do? So I want to basically try to train pi1 to recover from its own errors. Uh, so how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to put the expert back in the car. And I'm going to let pi1 drive the car. Uh, and the expert is going to be like trying to steer the car back onto the road, uh, but the car is going to completely ignore what the expert is doing, which is like terrifying for the expert. Um, but it, I'm going to end up collecting states from pi one's trajectory, but actions according to how the expert is trying to recover from whatever errors pi one is making. Okay, so sorry, give me one second, then I'll answer. So this gives me a new data set. And then I'm going to take the union of that data set and the previous one and learn a new classifier. OK, yeah, question. Won't the expert kind of overcorrect when you're using that nothing is happening? Yeah, probably. Um, so this algorithm has a bunch of problems. The biggest problem is you need to interact with the expert a lot, um, right? Like, and, and for a lot of these things, you know, you'll get into this situation where the expert's like, I mean, when you get here, the expert's like, well, there's nothing I can do. Um, so, uh, at, so for the, for the interpretation stuff, we're using a simulated expert. So we know we have an evaluation function. We know the output that the interpreter produced. And so we're going to have this synthetic expert that tries to pick actions that maximize whatever the reward function is that, or minimize whatever the loss function is that we care about. So we're not actually going to like, put an interpreter in the car. It'd be very hard to do this for like real interpreters anyway. Like you can't tell an interpreter, like pretend that you had said these five words, like how would you continue your interpretation, right? Like, this is, like no interpreter is going to be able to do that. Um, so eventually I'm going to massively reduce the amount of interaction we need with the person. Um, but this is what we had in, in 2014. And so um, this is what we did then. Uh, sort of like self-training like things. Is it basically just trying to get harder data points to aggregate from different kinds? Of I think it's sort of different. I mean, the, the main goal here is you want, like, I want to train my policy on states that it itself visits. So it's, it's more of an issue of the data distribution than of something else, right? There's, there's the expert data distribution, which is maybe too good. And so I want to train my thing on sort of this less good data distribution that's actually realistic for what I might see at test time. Um, so I, I think that's sort of the right intuition. OK, so these things are subscripted with numbers. And there's more space on the slide, which means there's more to come. So what do I do next? So now I have pi 2. I let pi 2 drive. The expert's still in the car. I collect a new data set. I take the union of everything I've seen so far. I train a new model. And I do this a bunch of times. Um, and so there's this nice result that basically says, like, if these trajectories are, are length t, and uh, you iterate this like roughly t log t times, 
um, you'll learn something that's, uh, that has low regret to the expert. So it'll be about as good as the expert as you can represent with your hypothesis class. Um, so there's some theory, um, which I won't talk about. Okay, so um, in our settings, remember the actions are like commit, predict, or wait. Um, and the features of the state are things like um, what are our internal predictors, like the final verb predictor predicting, and what are their confidence levels. We have some translation model scores and language model scores from our, our black box translator. And then we have previous decisions made by the policy, right? So have I been waiting for a long time? Um, OK, so how are we going to measure success? So um, measurement of success depends on two things, right? So one thing is what's the quality of the translation produced? And then the other thing is how much delay was there um, in the production of the translation? So in interpretation studies, this is often called ear voice span. So how long between when I hear a word and I, I speak the translation? So the way that we're going to evaluate is, is kind of weird, but um, we're going to take an off-the-shelf machine translation evaluation metric. So in this case, it's blue. And we're going to compute the blue score after one word, and then after two words, and then after three words, and after four words, and then at the end, at the entire sentence. And so hopefully, this is going up. Um, and so then uh, our final evaluation score is going to be the area under this curve. OK, so why is this the right, or why is this a reasonable thing to do? Well, if you like manage to magically guess the entire sentence after hearing one word, then you get like perfect blue for like all of time, and the area under the curve will be high. If you wait until the end, you're going to get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then you'll get a good translation at the end. OK, so that's the evaluation metric. Um, I will say, if you work on this problem, do not use this evaluation metric. It is gameable, and I'm kind of sad that the learning system did not learn to game it. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you want to know why, it, it's kind of, it has to do with the brevity penalty and stuff like that. It, it wasn't obvious at the time. We figured out about six months later that you can game it. OK, so, um, so the x-axis here is, uh, is this score. Um, so, so what are the different bars? So the red bar is a batch system that waits until the end of the sentence and then translates the full sentence. So it's very high quality, but very delayed. Um, the blue bar is, the is a monotone translation system that just here's a word, translates, here's a word, translates. So it's very simultaneous, but low quality. Um, the green bar is people, uh, so they're very good. <laughs> Uh, and then the purple bar is us, so we fall somewhere between the stupid things and the awesome thing, uh, which I guess is what you would hope to see. Yeah. Uh, what's your gold standard? Is it the batch translation? In this case, it's the, the, human, the interpretation, the human interpreter. So you're comparing the, the green bar is comparing uh, the interpreter? Yeah. And there's a lot of variance between interpreters. Uh, it also matters a lot how much experience they have. Um, so, so this is comparing two interpreters, both of whom have about 10 years of interpreting experience, which is they're very good. So the examples I showed are from this green bar. Yeah? Uh, when you teach an interpreter who is at that level, how good are they relative to here is a piece, if the interpreter here's a piece of text and you live in the language and translate it yourself? Um, so if you only, if you don't care about simultaneity, I mean, it, it degrades quite a bit. I mean, I would, like those examples I showed you before, right? Like, I, I think you, if I, if I didn't show you which was batch and which was interpreted and I asked you which one was which, like you would get it right every time. It, it's very obvious which one's uh, the interpreter. Um, if you, I, so one of the things that's interesting about interpreters is that it's very rare that they go into an interpretation job sort of carte blanche. So, like, you know, I will know that I'm interpreting for like Hal's talk on simultaneous interpretation, and I will ask Hal for lots of reading material um, so I can go get um, like translations of technical terms, and like I'll roughly know what's going to be talked about. Um, so if you, and th that was the case for this interpreter. So we tell them the vague topic of the TED Talks that they're interpreting and so on. Um, the, if you don't do that, the interpretation quality is much, much lower. Yeah? Is this example for a language pair that's the same word, or is this 
No, right, I should have put that on the slide. So this is Japanese English, um, which is a very hard case. Yeah, a uh, red one is much better. Um, so actually, let me show you the, the next picture. So this says a little bit more about what's going on. So on the x-axis, we have how much of the sentence has been heard at this point. And on the y-axis, we have the cumulative score, like the area under the curve, up until that point. Um, so the red, the batch system, right, it has zero until the end, and then it does well. Um, the interesting comparison here is blue versus purple, right? So blue is very aggressive, whereas purple can learn to be a little bit more conservative. Um, and so what happens is initially the monotone system is ahead because it's not as conservative. Um, but then at the end, uh, oh, I just realized I lied about something. Sorry, the re these results are German, not Japanese. Um, so this is German English. Uh, so the, the monotone system is ahead until the end when they flip, and this is basically because the monotone system has sort of committed to wrong stuff that it can't repair, whereas the, the conservatism of the, the purple system allows it to produce like an overall better translation. Um, the fact that the flip happens just at the end is largely due to the fact that this is German English, and the main word order difference between German and English is sometimes German puts the verb at the end, but otherwise the word order is like pretty similar. So the fact that the inversion happens at the end, I think, is, is largely because this is German. Um, yeah, okay. Questions about this? So it seems to me that uh, designing a synthetic expert, is that correct? Is not, is it not, it's not a feature. Uh, you mean like this example of like I went to Tokyo by plane, or a case where they actually make an explicit correction? I think we can get a mistake. Uh, how would you how do you decide what uh, an expert would do? With that? Yeah, so experts do make mistakes. It's pretty rare. They're very very encouraged not to make mistakes. <laughs> I, mean, I guess that's obvious, but you will occasionally hear interpreters say things like blah, 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 sorry, I meant blah, 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 blah. Um, right now, I mean, we don't capture this really at all because of the way we're evaluating. Um, yeah, so the, the evaluation measure that we're using, I mean, the, the chance that our sort of synthetic expert would actually produce something like that is basically zero. Um, so, so we basically don't model corrections. But then, how, how do you uh, how do you train? So, in the in the second time when you when you're trying to aggregate with some mistakes in the predictions, how do you make? Oh, so it'll pro. I mean, because of the way like blue score works, probably what it'll do is it'll just like continue on and pretend that the mistake didn't happen, okay. right? Because from the perspective of optimizing blue score, if if you were supposed to say like flower and you said grass, like probably you should just ignore that and, and continue. Yeah. Yes, it's worse because it's the, the y-axis is not the instantaneous score, but the cumulative score over time. Yeah, so if it were the instantaneous score, red would actually be higher than green. It does in the sense that you get penalized by the score for omitting stuff. Um, I mean, there, there's this super big question, which is like, what's the right way to evaluate this, right? And um, maybe I'll, I'll come back to this question later. OK, so, um, so this is all great except for the fact that humans are not perfect interpreters, right? So it's not entirely clear that what we should be doing is mimicking what humans are doing because humans drop information, humans generalize words. And like, these are things that, like if we want to be better than people at this task, like mimicking them is not like the path to getting there. Um, so what, do we, what, what can we do instead? So I'm going to assume that I can get some explicit reward signal at the end of the day that says, like, how good was this interpretation? Um, I'll come back to the question of how do I measure this, but um, I'm no longer going to try to mimic a person, but I'm just going to try to drive this final loss signal down as much as possible. 
Okay, so how am I going to do this? So we're going to go back to driving a car. Um, so I'm now going to have an online algorithm. I'm going to let my policy uh, drive the car for a bunch of time steps. And then it's going to get to some state. And I'm going to consider the, the possible actions at this state. So let's say it's just turn left, go straight, turn right. Um, so for each of these, I'm going to, OK, so I'm going to take the first action. And I'm going to let the human expert drive the car for the rest of time. Uh, they'll get to the end of whatever, uh, and I'll measure some loss. Let's say this is 0.4. So now I will rewind time. Like, caveat, rewinding time is hard. Um, so I will now rewind time, and I'll go back to this state, and I'll try another action, and I'll let the human drive for the rest of time. I'll get some loss. I'll rewind time again, take the last action, let the human drive, and then record some loss. Um, so there's a big problem here, which is like you can't actually rewind time. I will fix that in like two slides. Um, but for now, assume I can rewind time. So now for each of these possible actions, I have a cost. So I'm going to form uh, a training example where I have some features of uh, the state at that point in time. And then for every possible action that the system could take, I have some cost associated with that action. And so now I'm going to feed this into my like, online learning algorithm and tell it to try to choose uh, actions that minimize uh, cumulative cost. And so the big win here is like maybe it's really hard for the system to learn to take the sort of quote unquote correct action. And it would like to know that, you know, well, if I'm going to fail, I'd really prefer to fail this way than fail this other way. Um, OK, so uh, and then I repeat this. OK, so that's the algorithm. Um, so there's good stuff and bad stuff about this. So the nice thing is we're no longer requiring expert feedback at every action, right? We're not saying what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. And we also get these like relative costs, right? How bad is each type of error? Um, the problem is like you can't rewind time. <laughs> um, and the other problem is like you need to have access to this human who uh, th that's maybe sort of unrealistic, right? You need to play this game where you say, like, assume that you had said these five words, what would you do next? And, you know, this is going to be hard for human interpreters. So what we really want to do is we want to um, be able to optimize this long-term signal without relying strongly on an expert. And so the question is, how are we going to do that? So um, here's sort of another example of the, the sort of setting that, that we have in mind. Um, so I visited my mom recently. My mom vis lives in LA. She has an iPhone. I didn't know that iPhones do transcripts of voicemail, but apparently they do. Um, so sh uh, she got a voicemail from me as I was driving home. And I said, something, me, I are on PCH, and have fun. Be there in about hopefully less than a half hour, funny minutes. I think that's supposed to be 40 minutes uh, or so. Anyway, see you soon. Love you. Bye. And then. Um, she has this like, you know, was this transcription useful or not useful, right? So this is sort of like a thumbs up, thumbs down on like whether this, uh, this transcription was good or not. Like if you use Facebook uh, you, and you have friends who speak a language that Facebook doesn't think you speak, uh, you've probably seen that it'll let you translate and then it'll let you rate one to five stars. How good was the translation, right? So this is a form of explicit feedback and that's the sort of thing that we want to try to optimize. OK, so um, how is this going to work? So we're now going to be learning from what I'll call bandit feedback, which basically means I get to try one thing and one thing only. And then I'm going to get some loss. And then I want to optimize that loss. Uh, so how am I going to do this? So uh, I have some current policy. And I'm going to let it drive for a while. So if I'm translating, I'm going to let my model translate for you know, the first five words. So now I'm going to get to some state. And I'm going to pick what I'll call a deviation action. So instead of picking what my current model wants to do, I'll pick something else. Um, so now, after I've picked this other thing, I'm going to let my baseline system drive for the rest of time. So I'm not going to have an expert drive. I'm going to have some like off-the-shelf crummy system drive. Okay, so there's no expert at this at any point. right? So it's my learned system drives for a while. I deviate. And then I let my baseline system drive. So this gives me some uh, final cost. Um, so now the question is like, well, what if I had taken these other actions? Um, and so what I'm going to do is for every action that I didn't take, 
I'm going to have a little regression model sitting under the hood that tries to guess if I had taken that action, what would the, co what would the cost have been? And so this allows me to formulate the same sort of cost vector that I had in the previous example, where one of the costs is the actual observed cost, and the other costs are um, these hallucinated costs. Uh, well, so in this case, I'm assuming that it's, it's left, right, straight. In the translation case, um, it would be, you know, sort of wait, predict, commit. What's different about recycling from, like, the, the Monte Carlo rollout? Yeah, so, um, right, so then I'm going to repeat. So this is just a straight-up reinforcement learning algorithm, right? So it's a different reinforcement learning algorithm than, you know, sort of normal reinforcement learning. But it basically is just straight up reinforcement learning, right? So I have some long-term reward I'm trying to optimize. I'm going to try some trajectory. I'm going to measure a, a loss. And then I have some way of, of updating. So in terms of like comparison to existing algorithms, so like structurally, it's closest to actor critic-like algorithms, where this regressor is sort of playing the role of a critic. Um, and pi is sort of playing the role of an actor. Um, so we have some experiments, um, which I'm hoping will get out for ACL um, on neural MT, where it looks like it works better than like reinforce actor critic policy gradient stuff like that. Um, you can also prove something about this, and you basically can't prove squat about most of these other algorithms. Um, but it, it is just straight up RL in a sense. So the better your pi out, the better this algorithm is going to be. Right? Absolutely. Yep, that works. It's a good idea. Why do you have separate priors when you're doing something? Uh, because if I don't, I can't prove anything. But if you, you could use the learned policy as pi out, and then I can't prove anything, but uh, it works fine. So the reason you can't prove anything is because um, you, there are two things going on here, right? There's, there's distribution drift in the sense that as I learn, the states that my policy visits change. And that's relatively easy to handle. There's, so there's distribution shift on the input. If you allow pi out to change, there's also distribution shift on the loss. And it's really hard to do theory when p of y given x can change. Um, so that's technically why it's hard. Um, in practice, and I think the results I'll show you, we do the thing that you can't prove anything about, and it works better. Um, yeah. Okay, so, um, all right, algorithm makes sense. I didn't tell you how to train the regression model. I'm not going to tell you. You can read our rejected AI stats paper. Um, it's very sad. Uh, but uh, anyway, so, um, okay, so... Here we have human feedback, which is thumbs up, thumbs down. Actually, in this case, we're using one star to five star. Um, but that's the only required supervision per entire input, right? We're not getting like per step feedback or something. Um, and the way we're evaluating it is sort of the online learning evaluation, where as you go along, you make predictions, you suffer some loss, and then you get the average loss. Yeah, okay, so the way that we're evaluating is in this, so this is totally simulated evaluation. So we have, we know what the ground truth is, and we measure similarity to ground truth according to whatever evaluation function you want. Um, it's not the same as Facebook, you mentioned where... It is not, I, we're, I, I have some things to say about that, but let me uh, delay that a little bit. Okay, so um, so now this is the point where I say like look over here, and and you know you're going to be very disappointed in me. So uh, we had so I said like we're hoping to have this paper for ACL on neural MT. We don't have that right now. So I the results I'm going to show you are um, like sort of more boring NLP tasks. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, so we're going to do sort of the standard litany of NLP tasks. So like part of speech tagging, dependency parsing, syntactic chunking, stuff like that. So we start out with some reference policy, which is the crummy system that we're trying to improve. Um, so this is just a, a standard model trained on a small amount of data. 
Um, so it does kind of crummy, right? This is really bad part of speech accuracy um, and really bad dependency parsing accuracy. So then we had this paper at ICML 2015 where we proved a nice theorem but never did any experiments. And then we decided to run some experiments. Turns out algorithm doesn't work at all. Um, so you run it um, over like uh, you know, 20,000 sentences or whatever Penn Tree Bank is and part of speech tagging accuracy drops to 2%. Um, so random guessing on this task is 13%. Um, so this is doing markedly worse than random guessing. Um, so the only difference between this algorithm and the one that I described before is it does not do the, um, the counterfactual estimation for the untaken actions. Um, and so the way that it forms the cost vector is for the action that was selected, we get the observed loss, we multiply that by the number of possible actions, and we say that's the cost there, and all the other costs are zero. And you might say, why would you do that? And I say, because if I take the expectation of that cost vector over a uniform random choice of action, the expectation works out to the correct thing. Um, so the expectation is right, but the variance is like ridiculous. It's like k squared, where k is the number of actions, um, and that just kills this algorithm. Um, so if we, uh, if we do the counterfactual estimation, the algorithm works. Um, so this is like one pass over the data, so you never see any example more than once. Um, and uh, pretty much everything goes up, um, although uh, not as much on, on the dependency parsing. So we tried a bunch of other ways of doing exploration. So we did Boltzmann exploration and Thompson sampling. This helps a little bit, although I was a little disappointed that um, better exploration didn't give better, didn't give like markedly better results. So because this is synthetic, I can actually do what I'll call sort of like oracle exploration. So every time it chooses to explore, I'm just gonna magically have it choose to explore the right way. And if you do this, you get numbers that are basically competitive with supervised learning. So this is like super awesome to me because basically what it means is like if we could do exploration well, then uh, using only the bandit feedback, we could learn basically just as well as we had fully labeled data. Um, but we have no idea how to do exploration that well. Um, so just to give a sense of the numbers, that's going to be like 96 here, like 92 here, and I think like 95 or something like that here. Um, OK, so you can play with the code if you want. Uh, let's see, so what time is it? OK, so we've got like 10 minutes. So uh, do we have questions about this stuff? Are you, um, not sure if you missed if I missed this. Uh, what is reference here? Um, so reference is a crummy statistical model trained on a very, very small amount of data. It's basically trained on like one section of Wall Street Journal. Well, we wanted some, I mean, because we needed headroom so that we can improve, right? <laughs> um, I, I mean, so, so the neural MT experiments that, that I'm not showing here are, the setting is I train like a neural MT system on like Newswire, like WMT News, and then um, I now get data from like movie subtitles. And so it's kind of a domain adaptation setting. I mean, it's very much like the Facebook setting, right? Like, uh, but we don't have access to social media posts. We have access to movie subtitles. Movie subtitles is also nice because it's enormous. And because we're, we, we're only allowing ourselves to look at each example once, you need a really large data set in order to like, get gains, which is actually a big problem. So in like, the translation setting, I mean, you need like a million, 10 million uh, feedbacks in order to like, get substantial wins. Yeah? So I'm, I'm trying to align what you just said No, this is definitely a point along the way. I mean, we, with, with one exception, which I'm not talking about here, we haven't done anything with actual people. And the reason is basically because the sample complexity of these algorithms is still so high that you know, we would have to spend $5 million to, to get anywhere. And so um, with one exception, basically, uh, the game that we're playing now is you know, how can I get the 
the amount of interaction necessary down as low as possible. Um, and that in sort of this idealized simulated setting and then, and then move over to the more realistic setting. But, but isn't there potentially an argument that this is you know, completely the wrong class of algorithms because as you say, you, you need to move down orders of magnitude. It's not like you're gonna optimize this by a factor of two and likely be good. Yep. And I guess what it makes me think is getting feedback at, at the end is the RL paradigm, but it has this uh, tree-like structure that leads you to need a lot of data. Yep. Maybe you need to structure things so you get feedback uh, immediately, but a lot less of it because you're getting feedback on a segment rather than on a full path. Yeah. So, so we've we've also I I have zero results on this, but we've also played around with a version where, like in the translation setting, the feedback you get is the user crosses out the worst part of the translation. Right, and this, I mean, it's a little bit more onerous for the user, but it's like such better feedback, right? And, you know, so I don't have results to quote, but I could easily imagine that you need way less interaction, right? And then there becomes like this interesting interaction with, you know, like interface design and stuff like that on, you know, how do you actually structure this so that you get the sort of feedback that's useful? Um, so I, I think that you know, I'd like to think that, you know, this you only get feedback at the end, you can learn something, but I think more realistically, um, that's too weak. Um, I, I think you do need more. And then, and then there's like this huge design space of what's the right thing to do. So yeah, I, I think I agree with you. Yeah. So <clears throat> how, I guess, when we're thinking about this problem of a simultaneous interpretation, um, the, the approaches you talked about were sort of the supervised learning approach from uh, human simultaneous interpreters and then this kind of reinforcement learning approach. I mean, we have a lot of unlabeled data for these languages, right? So, so my thought would be that you could learn some sort of language model and then use that with kind of traditional machine translation techniques. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to how those things relate and yeah so I guess the closest thing we've done is the following so um, so I'm not gonna use unlabeled data I mean in a sense the neural MT uses unlabeled data a little bit because it has like offline word embeddings or whatever but um, the so the, the closest thing we've done is like we have piles of batch translated data, which are really good from like a fluency adequacy perspective, but kind of crummy from a simultaneity perspective. And so uh, like, let's say we're doing Japanese English. Um, so I have a giant Japanese English parallel corpus. So I'm gonna parse the English side, and then I'm gonna try a bunch of like syntactic reorderings on the English side that I know because of linguistics or whatever are like reasonable transformations, so passivization or genitive alternation and stuff like that. And I'm gonna try to rewrite this thing so that it's as monotone with the Japanese as possible. Um, and then I'm gonna retrain my, say, neural MT system on this new data, and hopefully it just learns to straight up be more simultaneous. Um, so this works. Um, the thing that's actually, so it's not, I guess it's not super surprising that this works when you measure quality of translation. Okay, so let's call this processed English, like fudged English. Um, so if you measure the quality of the translation against a fudged test set, performance goes up. That's not super surprising. If you measure quality of translation even just against the original unfudged data set, Qual like translation quality also goes up. And so this is sort of like this game that like neural nets people play with MNIST where they, you know, like rotate the digits a little bit and translate them and stretch them where you're doing um, uh, like sort of this data set augmentation. And, um, and basically that works here too. Um, as far as like straight up unlabeled data, we haven't really done anything. Yeah. That's a baseline that you have is a LSTM that sees the both of them language. That you see the English word and then the Japanese word and then feed it to make sense of that. So how does that work? I don't know. We should try it. <laughs> I think that's, do you think it's a, like a baseline that's great? I think so. I mean, people have, there have been a couple of papers that try to do sort of like, I'll say, quote unquote, obvious um, 
modifications of like sort of you know by LSTM style neural machine translation to do simultaneous interpretation. Um, I mean, the, the biggest problem, I mean, the problem with doing this in a neural setting is um, you can't, it, it's not differentiable because of the, the possibility of weighting. And so you basically have to like policy gradient it or you have to find some hack around that. And so um, there are papers that have tried both, um, neither of which is super compelling. Um, but I, I can point to you if you're interested. Okay, so I said I was gonna talk about question answering. I'm not actually gonna talk about question answering. Um, but anyway, there's questions and there are answers and you can do reinforcement learning and there's Q learning and there are neural networks and there are more complicated neural networks and performance goes up and that's great. Um, okay, so uh, if you wanna to talk to me about deep Q learning, so, so really the message in the, the previous bit that I just skipped over is that um, if I'm in like an interactive question answering setting and I can try to learn something, I can basically try to personalize my question answering system to you. So, so this is like competitive QA, so like Jeopardy. So I might learn that you're really good at science questions but not really good at literature questions. And so then I can be more aggressive on literature questions because I know you're not gonna do as well. And so I can sort of explicitly model my opponent and my neural network and then do deep Q learning on that and, and it makes things markedly better. Okay, so that's the story. Uh, that was an ICML paper last summer if you wanna look it up. Um, okay, so this is joint work with tons and tons of people. So the stuff that I talked about um, that I did not skip over is mostly, oh, that doesn't work, is mostly Alvin and Ha. Um, so uh, Ha will be on the job market next year. She's a postdoc at Stanford right now. You should totally hire her. Um, she's awesome. Okay, so um, yeah, so let me just sort of wrap up. So um, the, the sort of like dominant paradigm that I'm trying to push is like, we have some existing system for solving a task that's kind of crummy, um, maybe because of domain adaptation issues or maybe because I don't have enough labeled training data or something like that, and I wanna collect this feedback to try to improve it over time. Uh, so there's a couple big questions that I think are really interesting. So one is this offline acquired data question. So I said a little bit about this, right? So we have these two data sources, the batch translations and the human interpretations. And in some ways, I wanna learn something that's better than either of these, right? I want it to be more simultaneous than the batch translations, but higher quality than the human interpretations. And so like, uh, so I sketched sort of one idea of how to do that, but I think there's a much bigger like general question there. Um, right, so this is basically Oren's question. So how do we reduce the amount of interactions? So maybe by changing the type of interaction. Um, and then the last thing, uh, which there was a little bit in the part that I skipped over, is this, this implicit feedback versus explicit feedback. So um, there's this paper that it's kind of goofy, but I really like it by Mark Rydell out of Georgia Tech. So they're trying to use reinforcement learning to learn to play Frogger. Um, so in Frogger, you have a little frog and you're trying to get to the top of the screen and there are cars that are trying to kill you. I mean, they're not trying to kill you, they're just driving and they will kill you. Um, and so this is actually a really hard thing to learn because you, you get a negative signal when you get hit by a car and you only get a positive signal if you get to the top of the screen. And so basically if you throw straight up RL at this, it just learns to stay where it is because basically anything it does just gets it killed. Um, <laughs> Some people like sort of cheat on this where they give a reward as you move further north in the screen and then the RL is easy. Um, but against the sort of zero one binary reward, it's a really hard thing to learn. Um, okay, so what do they do? So while the RL is learning, they have a person watching what it's doing and they hook this person up to a microphone and the person is like, no, or like, <laughs> good job or whatever. And so they run sentiment analysis on the speech coming out of the person, and they use this to shape the reward function to try to learn uh, that going north is good. Okay, so kind of gimmicky, kind of goofy, um, but I think it's actually like pushing in exactly the right direction, right? So I think that these explicit signals that we're optimizing, like the one star to five star, I mean, I was talking to like Facebook people a while ago and they were like, yeah, no one clicks those. And I was like, oh, <laughs> well, there goes my idea. Um, uh, so I think that like, um, we really need systems that can learn from sparse explicit signals 
but much more common implicit signals. So the thing that we're playing around with right now is like at every time step, or at most time steps, you get some sort of implicit feedback, like the good job or you know, more salt or whatever. Um, and you somehow, and then once in a while you get explicit feedback. And then the question is, can you learn something that maps the implicit feedback to the explicit feedback so you can use that for driving learning? Um, so I think there's lots of things you can do here. I have you know, basically only ideas. Um, you should have ideas too and, and, and do them because I think it's super fun. Um, okay, so that's it. I'll stop and, and take last questions.